Weapons round here. No one is quite sure. But British troops have made another discovery. They've rescued two Kenyans captured by the Iraqis 10 days ago while driving an aid convoy through the town. We praise God because we are very lucky now to see that we are not dying because when we are there, we are praying God day and night. We don't sleep. Most of the people of Azubaya seem happy enough to have British troops here, but by no means everyone. This man tells me the British should go home. Yes, yes, yes. We all love Saddam Hussein, he says, and the crowd cheer in agreement. They even kiss his picture. When Saddam was in charge, we had water and electricity, says another man. Now we've got nothing. What sort of help is that? Well, actually, the British have brought help, food and water for the desperate people of Azerbaijan. But this ends up an exercise in riot control rather than aid distribution. British troops are trying to win hearts and minds as well as the war. But they're finding out it can be a bruising business. Ben Brown, BBC News, Azerbaijan, in southern Iran. Just the other side of the Tigris River being targeted again, definitely by cruise missiles. We heard it coming over distinctly and a huge plume of smoke uh, rising over the city. This has been going on throughout the day and into the night because the uh, bombing uh, in the center of the city and on the edges of the Iraqi capital now round the clock. Fresh drinking water over the border from Kuwait. Enough water every day to sustain one million people. Getting it to them is more complicated. The water must be pumped into tanker trucks and then driven north. A fix, perhaps, but not a solution. People can survive without food for a fairly long time. We, uh, human beings, we cannot survive without water. Water is essential. After 12 years of UN economic sanctions, many people were already suffering. But the Allied invasion and the Iraqi resistance that followed it has put them over the edge. The soldier you on the billboards in Iraq. Some children were bitter, but others seemed to accept the Allies' justification for the war. Because they came to liberate us and uh, get, 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 get us free. A mobile radio station in southern Iraq. British Army psychological warfare operations aim principally now at Basra. My fellow soldiers, the Saddam Hussein regime is in its final days. Frustrated by the lack of the expected uprising in the city, the British Army says they are now stepping up transmissions, hoping to turn the people and the tide of this war. There's Jennifer Lopez and other Western music for the youngsters, and traditional Arab music. And in between, there are these messages. We have entered your country not as enemies of the Iraqi people, We've got to control their information flow, what they're receiving. Firstly, primarily, to stop what they're getting out of Baghdad. There is also the ongoing leaflet drop over Basra. This is the most important message the British are trying to sell right now. This is the entrance to the city of Basra, and the British admit they don't know the effect their psyops are having inside the city. They admit they're shooting a little blind right now, and they acknowledge that Saddam Hussein has a highly accomplished propaganda machine. And it still works well. The regime continues to inspire such terror that these people leaving the city didn't want to talk on camera. But many say they do get the leaflets and the radio messages, but they say what they need is food, water, and respite from the bombing. Some told us Saddam's party loyalists still control the city. With the firefights echoing in their ears, some told us they and everyone they know wants to see Saddam gone, but until then, they'll remain silent. Al Jazeera Arab television sends out pictures of the wounded in Basra's hospital and people told us that civilians are being hurt in the artillery and tank duels between the British and Iraqi forces inside. The British want to deliver humanitarian aid to Basra to improve their chances of winning people's confidence. But so far they're having to settle for the towns that they've already secured on the outskirts. Christiana Manpour, CNN near Basra in southern Iraq. And the temperature cools. The war heats up. Or does it?
U.S. Special Operations Forces consider themselves a force multiplier, and tonight they will literally be. Their strategy, add one Special Operations Humvee with a loudspeaker mounted on top to one British tank and four armored vehicles, and suddenly this tiny force sounds like an invading division. It is called Psychological Operations, or PSYOPs, part of the U.S. Special Forces repertoire. Their speaker blares the music of disinformation and confusion, broadcast at ear-splitting decibels. The audio tape of recorded tank sounds plays for more than an hour, a show meant for the ears of Iraqi forces in Basra, a short distance away. Adding to the realism, flares are fired to illuminate Iraqi positions. British tanks fire occasional rounds at Iraqi targets. The man orchestrating the racket, a 50-year-old special operations veteran who calls this war his last rodeo, turns the speaker in several directions to add to the illusion of a massive frontal attack. Occasionally, Iraqi combatants fire back with mortars, machine guns, and artillery. The coalition hopes this grand deception will force the Iraqis to move troops where they don't need to be moved make them look where they don't need to look. Around Basra, the battlefield has become a true twilight zone, where fact and fiction are indistinguishable in the inky blackness of a moonless night. Mike Betcher, CNN, with U.S. Special Operations Forces on the outskirts of Basra. By a car bomb in a taxi, a suicide bomber. So U.S. troops have been using uh, very strict rules of engagement about uh, encountering vehicles on the road. In this case, according to the U.S. military version of events, a civilian vehicle was approaching a checkpoint. Soldiers from the uh, Army's 3rd Infantry Division motioned for it to stop. It did not. Uh, they fired some warning shots, they say, into the engine of the uh, vehicle. It still didn't stop. Then they fired on the occupants. It turned out that it were, there were 13 women and children inside. Seven were killed. Two were injured, uh, four were unharmed. Uh, there's no evidence that this was a, a bomb or terrorist attack. It's not known why the vehicle didn't stop. Pentagon officials say that the soldiers did follow the rules of engagement. Nevertheless, an investigation is underway because of the number of apparent innocent civilian deaths. Meanwhile, the, the war is being pressed on, and the Pentagon said today that they're convinced if they keep the pressure on, it will eventually break the will of the Iraqi regime. After dropping more than 3,000 bombs on Iraq in three days, the Pentagon says the combination of punishing airstrikes and probing ground attacks against three Republican Guard divisions south of Baghdad have cut their combat effectiveness in half. We see some very significant weakening, and it will hit a tipping point in some of their formations. But despite the unprecedented shock and awe aerial bombardment and the impressive lightning ground march to the outskirts of Baghdad, the U.S. strategy has so far failed to achieve one stated goal, to create a sense of inevitable defeat such that the Republican Guard would fold or key members of Saddam Hussein's inner circle might turn on him. There have been as yet no defections of very senior politicians or very senior military commanders. While U.S. officials note they have seen only videotaped appearances by Saddam Hussein and his sons, other members of the regime continue to broadcast defiant messages. With each day, the, uh, America, America and Britain wade into a quagmire and the losses increase for those two outlawing. The U.S. says while Iraq's guerrilla and terror tactics may have so far prevented any popular uprisings or wholesale surrenders, the Pentagon insists it's only a matter of time. The inevitable outcome is more than a feeling. Well, it is reality. Pentagon sources say the U.S. will continue to whittle away at the Republican Guard divisions that surround Baghdad and follow the model of British troops in Basra, avoiding urban combat and using local citizens to identify and destroy loyalist strongholds. This is a Ba'ath Party headquarters building in Al-Hila. 
At some point, sources say the U.S. military may try to take out an entire Republican Guard division in order to send a powerful psychological message to the Iraqi military and the regime. But the Pentagon says the one thing it has plenty of is patience to wait for the right time to carry that out. The battle for Baghdad decisively by combining the U.S. Army with the overnight shipping business, since the alternative is 300 miles of desert traffic, all of it northbound. It now comes here, one of several forward air bases secured by U.S. Special Forces inside Iraq. We are bringing supplies in now very, very close. These forward bases just give the commanders great, great flexibility. There are believed to be about 10 forward air bases in all. They include two with names like H-2 and H-3 in western Iraq, a new one southwest of Najaf and the central hub in Talil. They form a kind of noose around the ultimate prize, the Iraqi capital. And all of this work has happened in just the last 12 days. It's the equivalent of moving a city by air. Everything comes through here, fuel, food, and troops. This is the long-range surveillance team from Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Start moving your rucksacks, everything on the other side of that truck over there. Their job is to find Iraqi troops and report back on their location. But first, they had to get up close. This puts them 30 minutes from the front. This, a night mission we were allowed to fly along on, resupplying special operations troops. The pilots know forward air bases can mean getting shot at, but they fly anyway. There can be uh, a lot of bad guys out there that, you know, don't like what we're doing. Supply routes that for decades have been used to deliver water to Umkasser. They've been thirsty here for more than a week. But today, a new source of water. More than half a million gallons a day, donated by Kuwait, pumped through a one and a half mile pipeline hastily built across the border by British engineers. The guys have just worked from dawn till dusk. Bunch of it in five days, which is a considerable engineering feat, to be honest. Lack of fresh water is the biggest humanitarian problem in southern Iraq right now. But this new pipeline is changing that. Finally, the water trucks are filling up again. Just in time for Iraqis on the verge of a major health crisis, underscored today by villagers who spoke with my colleague Ann Curry. Iraqis watching the British pump water from the other side of a security fence. This father of four says not a house in Amkasar is without a sick child. What are the children complaining of? What kind of symptoms do they have? The children have dizziness and diarrhea, he says. This boy is saying his throat is sore from thirst. People here welcome the water, but say Iraqi tanker drivers are charging them for it. Are you selling the water? No, it's not. This Iraqi driver admits some have charged. The British call it extortion and say it will be stopped. By afternoon, water from the pipeline is finally reaching villagers, a beginning to what many hope will be the end of a water crisis across southern Iraq. Don Teague, NBC News, Mkasser, Iraq north of Najaf. Tensions are high here, these soldiers unsure of when and where the enemy will attack. Last night, some of their colleagues were involved in one of the bloodiest incidents in the war so far. At a checkpoint, troops opened fire on a van which failed to stop. Commanders say they fired warning shots, but afterwards found the van was filled with women and children. At least seven were killed. Certainly these were innocent people. But we continue to see these tactics of terror all over the battle space against uh, UK forces and US forces. And so they're watching very closely. Still trying to get to the bottom of the actual facts of what happened. There are news reports, there are reports. It's what we know as, as the fog of war. Fog of war that became denser with this suicide attack over the weekend. A tactic that's changed the nature of the conflict forever. It's made American troops warier of civilians, suspicious of every man, woman and child. There are practical rules for guards on checkpoints in war zones. An official statement says warning shots were fired, then shots at the engine to stop the car involved. But a report from a nearby American journalist says those rules weren't followed. The reporter claims an officer was heard telling a soldier that a family had died because he failed to fire a warning shot quickly enough. An investigation's begun, and it's reported the bereaved Iraqi families involved have already been offered compensation. In some cases, uh, we can make 
when we believe it's appropriate down at the lowest levels, there's, there's immediate compensations that can be made to families. That, that can happen. And we do that all over the world, not just here where we're in combat operations. And that's a commander's discretion to decide whether there's some immediate compensation that just says we're sorry that we can do. But as the coalition consolidates its grip on the country, there will inevitably be more checkpoints and more dangers. In a fresh incident today, U.S. troops shot dead what turned out to be an unarmed Iraqi driver at a checkpoint near Shatra. Instructions have been given to use roadblocks to halt vehicles well before they're checked. British soldiers are also having to check thousands of civilian vehicles every day. And army spokesmen admit the recent killings will severely undermine attempts to win over the local population. Tim Wilcox, BBC News. Thank you very much. Well, as you come to the border now, you can see the intense movement of uh, goods and materials. These are the Humvee uh, vehicles of the US military. Uh, they're equivalent of our sort of Land Rover, I would think, in Britain. And there are hundreds of them lining up to go into Iraq as we speak. Those vehicles are heading into Iraq. There is another huge convoy at this border crossing point that we're showing you at the moment, just waiting to come out. And I've been looking around there and it's just lines and lines, I think, of empty fuel tankers that have been into Iraq. They were, we saw them going in uh, yesterday and they're now uh, coming out whilst you have another convoy sort of backed up as far as the eye can see, uh, waiting to go in. If we just swing the camera rob round the, the other way, you can see all these vehicles sort of lining up there, uh, just waiting to go into Iraq. Presumably they're tr preferring to travel at night. We've got about an hour of daylight left uh, before darkness falls and then they'll be using night sights uh, to guide themselves uh, through uh, the key areas around. But let's get a feeling of what has been happening in southern Iraq today. Street by street, house by house, US troops fight their way into the town of Hindia. This was some of the toughest fighting of the war so far, and it took place yesterday just 50 miles from Baghdad. Narrow brushes with death sent American adrenaline pumping. I lit it up with HG, boom, 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 boom. Another one slams. There's a building right behind me. Woo, right in the building behind me. I mean, right up by the hatch. Hey, I, I, so you know me, I'm on the radio cussing. Why in the hell we stop? Boom, damn it. Hindia is a strategically important town on the Euphrates River. The Pentagon needs to secure it. Saddam's forces don't want to give it up. They dug in across the river, hiding and sniping from hedgerows and walls. On the bridge over the river, an Iraqi woman was caught in the crossfire. Wounded and terrified, US soldiers then went to her rescue. This US officer survived a ricochet bullet inside his vehicle. What was it? What was it? Well, an Iraqi, obviously. Ricochet? Yeah, you just got yourself a purple hey, sir, heart. Buddy. Give him a cigar. Let's go. Today, the fighting continues, trapping Iraq's unfortunate civilians. This is now the front line, and the U.S. is up against Iraq's Republican Guard. They look likely to fight hard every inch of the way to Baghdad. Frank Gardner, BBC News. Chaotic scenes as food parcels arrive in eastern Safwan. They've been here barely a week, but the RAF regiment is pushing to gain some control, feeding this town yet trying to police it at the same time. Warning shots show the level of nervousness here. Men shuffle in the background, observing everything. This man told me it's those with the most muscle that are in control, and the RAF suspect militiamen still have influence here. Uh, the Kuwaiti uh, foods comes, they're strong, he took more than the weak. So uh, the week he didn't have anything. Food handouts like these may be bringing towns to the very edge of anarchy, but the military know they need to continue if they're to win some trust. But it's clear it'll take more than just food and water to win over hearts and minds. People in this parched part of desert welcome coalition aid, but they fear the repercussions of getting too close. What they are saying now that if, uh, if the regime finish in Baghdad, then they will not trust us, because up to now they think that the, the regime will come back. So there is no trust. 
As huge bowsers distribute water, aid agencies are preparing to move in. The military will continue to play a supporting role, but it remains a very fragile situation here. Karen Allen, BBC News, Safwan, Southern. Under British control. Soldiers from the Duke of Wellington's regiment were patrolling outside Safwan in Berets today. The helmets off order was given to try to help win the confidence of local people, building on the experience the British Army has of working in Northern Ireland. That's like Northern Ireland experience. We've, uh, we've always took off uh, the helmets, gone to the berries, and it's always fetched people out to talk to us a bit more than what we do with the helmets on. They seem to be to smile a lot more than a lot of shouting that they used to be against us. So I believe, I believe the berries are working more than the helmets are. Helmets have also been discarded in Ramallah, Umkasar and El Zubaya, towns in southern Iraq where there was fierce fighting until just a few days ago. Explosive sniffing dogs have also been brought up to what was the front line. Their job to join soldiers searching houses for weapons that could be used by irregular forces. On the first house that we went into, he found an AK-47 rifle, um, 239 rounds, uh, six grenades, with all their fuses in, um, bomb making equipment and also four empty magazines uh, for the weapon itself. The fact that soldiers can patrol in berets so soon is considered a major achievement by military commanders. They hope it'll show the Iraqi people that life is getting back to normal, that they come not as conquerors but liberators. Roland Burke, BBC News. Nazaria say they had no idea what was stored inside this warehouse. So when U.S. Marines began loading their trucks with flower bags to be distributed further down the road, a group of about 100 villagers converged to collect their share. The Iraqi military used to take all the supplies and would not pass it to the people, says Karim Jassim, with whom we spoke through a U.S. military interpreter. Jassim, a farmer, came here with eight family members, including two young girls, in search of food. We are hungry, he says. He has not been in town for fear of being drafted by the Iraqi military. The fighting, he says, was not so intense in his area, but two of his relatives were killed by U.S. helicopter gunships, he says. He holds no grudges. Around here, he says, it's normal. Arabic-speaking Marines try to keep the unruly crowd under control, backed by heavily armed colleagues in the back. Women were allowed in first, picking up bags so large and heavy that some could not muster enough strength to carry them by themselves. Others walked away barefoot. Nearby, underneath one of the bridges now under control of U.S. Marines, another group of villagers collects water from a filthy pond. The aftermath of the intense firefight a week earlier still visible, the riverbed littered with Iraqi ammunition. So it is dangerous, uh, but we know where it is. And they, again, we pass the civilians, please stay away because it is dangerous. The entire area around the bridge is covered with hundreds of Iraqi mortars and grenades. Some of them, Marines say, could be loaded with chemical or biological agents. We cannot destroy these ourselves. We have to have our EOD teams come out, look at them, make an assessment. Yes, it is an explosive, and then they can uh, collect it and destroy it. Helping Iraqis get food and water is a priority, U.S. Marines say. Winning their hearts and minds is as important as winning the war. Then maybe later, just maybe, life could start to be normal again. Alessio Vinci, CNN, with the U.S. Marines in Nazaria. Soon be Baghdad. Here's how we come to that conclusion. First, there's that continuous pounding of the uh, Medina Division uh, by the Air Force south of Baghdad. The Medina Division, according to some sources, Air Force sources, has now been degraded by Air Force bombing by at least 50, perhaps upwards of 70 percent. That means the southern defenses of Baghdad have been weakened. Again, gradually, the U.S. Army's 3rd Infantry Division uh, has pushed northward. It uh, crossed the Euphrates River yesterday uh, below Al Hilla, and the 7th Cavalry, again, uh, as, long, as well as the 3rd Infantry Division, is now within 50 to 60 miles of the southern suburbs of Baghdad. Again, all signs focus, especially with more and more U.S. troops coming ashore in Kuwait, the 4th Infantry Division, that there's going to be a major push toward Baghdad in the not-too-distant future. The reason, of course, being you can see all those troops coming ashore. They'll be pouring into Iraq. 
Uh, and uh, it, it, again, the Air Force bombing around Baghdad, everything hints to a, a change in focus coming in the coming days and weeks on Baghdad. It will be the fo entire focus of the war. Baghdad will be the end game. Down in the sky, this is uh, an Al Jazeera video phone report, but uh, the video uh, really telling the story there. Now, flares can indicate a major military assault is underway, or they could indicate that the, the soldiers from the psychological operations group are back at work. These illumination rounds uh, in the sky, uh, obviously the Al Jazeera crew uh, getting ready for what could be either an aerial or an artillery attack. Brown was with them. British troops haul down the Iraqi flag from a school in Azubaya, for the children have gone from here and stashed in among their desks an enormous arsenal of weapons. The soldiers of A Company have discussed.